Keeper, and welcome back to On Air. Glad you can join me. I hope you had a fantastic weekend. Today, part one of a two-part story about the Direct Selling Association, the DSA, we asked the question, are they in trouble? As companies begin to whisper in their hallways about the relevancy of the DSA, we asked, with only 188 members out of the thousands of companies in direct selling, even though they are fast-tracking new memberships as quickly as possible, are they in trouble? Their membership numbers are well below their peak, and is politics also having a huge impact on the direct selling association? As companies and company owners are now pouring millions of dollars into politicians' bank accounts in order to prop them up, are they going around the DSA saying that the DSA no longer can handle their needs? We also look at a couple of recent articles by DSA Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer Amy Robinson in the two past issues of Direct Selling News and asked the question, what is going on? Is the DSA in trouble? We ask that today here on On Air. When my mother used to sell Princess House. Join them way that night. Norma siempre vendía cosas de Avon. Oh, it must have been around 1935. But those knives were amazing. The one lady's name was Mary Kay, and I said, oh, cosmetics will never sell on Party Plan. Uh, was a single mom and created these hair care products for black women and became the first self-made millionaire in the United States. I just think that's extraordinary. Welcome back to On Air. I'm going to start out this segment with a statement that I want to read to you, so just kind of bear with me. Because all this leads back into a couple of recent articles written by Direct Selling Association President Amy Robinson in the past two issues of Direct Selling News. But just kind of bear with me here. Let me just do this. The current state of network marketing direct selling. I'm annoyed. And I'm fed up. No, I'm more than that. I'm angry. Angry at the negative too often thrown at our companies, at our industry, at us executives employed in it. I'm also embarrassed, embarrassed that we haven't done a much better job at having those who misunderstand us, misjudge us, and misrepresent us get it straight, get it right, as to what we are and what we stand for. But I'm truly glad we're going to increase our efforts to change this situation. Some of you may be wondering, what's he talking about? Bear with me as I explain. I've spent more than 32 years representing this industry, and I love it dearly and with good reason. When you and your companies do it right, there is no finer business in the world, a business that touches and enhances and uplifts the lives of millions and millions of people across the globe. As an industry, many of, those, many of whose products have become household names, it also, and, it, and it also is an industry that has no equal with giving back to the community through the generosity and kindness of salespeople and its corporate leaders. Why then does the inherent goodness and economic value of our industry not counter the negatives thrown at us? Why does half the population of the United States, based on our latest research, have a negative or somewhat negative perception of us? Why are our companies often undervalued by Wall Street, maligned by regulators, scoffed at by the intellectual elite, and underestimated by almost everyone? Back in 1976, when pollster Lou Harris did our first major attitudinal study, he concluded that the negative perception by the American public was so deep, so ingrained, that we could spend millions of dollars per year for 20 years and not dent it. At the same time, he told us, ironically, there was a major disconnect between consumers' perceptions about us and their personal experiences with us, deeply ingrained, negative stereotypes about the unknown and uninvited front in the foot in the door high pressure saleswoman or salesman went hand in glove with personal satisfaction with the Avon lady, their fuller brush man, the and their world book saleswoman and their electrolux sales representative. Largely because of Harris's advice and lack of financial wherewithal, the DSA did not embark on an image building program. 
Over the years, the high pressure types were contained and then largely under eliminated by the industry's support of cooling of cooling uh, laws of cooling off laws. But still, the negatives remain high. High pressure sales tactics were replaced over the years by pyramid schemes operating in the guise of direct selling companies, and the negative stereotypes persisted. In thinking of the whys and wherefores of this question, knowing of the incredible good our industry does for so many, the following thought struck me. On a global, on a global scale, we now have more than 46 million sales people affiliated with our firms on an annual basis. That's 46 million generally unsupervised people, the equivalent to the populations of a fairly large country. If we were a country instead of an industry, we would expect there to be thieves and con men above the population. We also expect there to be saints as well as sinners, heroes, cowards, leaders, and followers, but mostly just plain good God-fearing folks. What I'm getting at is because of our huge number of distributors, that tiny minority percentage of bad actors on the fringe of our business is, in, actually, in actual total numbers, a sizable number of people. We all know that bad news gets on TV, in the newspapers, and in the magazines a lot more frequently than good does. If only one hundredth of one percent of our, fail, of our sales force misbehaves, that would be 4,500 bad actors, 4,500 miscreants. That number would generate a lot of negative publicity, wouldn't it? So, if that's the case, can we ever change perception? Can we eliminate stereotypes? Can we change the world's view? The answer simply is yes, we can, and we have to. Those words were spoken by then DSA President Neil Offen back in 19, excuse me, back in 2002 on June 9th at the DSA's annual meeting in Boca Raton, Florida. That was 12, excuse me, nine years ago. And the reason why I bring this up because the DSA continues to struggle with image enhancement programs for our entire community. They can't seem to get it right. We, here at Direct Selling Live, gave them the roadmap in 2005 when we wrote the book on marketing, Network Marketing's guide, Official Guide to the Urban Market, how to use sports and entertainment marketing to increase the image of direct selling. We spoke to a number of high-powered people in entertainment. In this book, which anyone could get for free, and we sent to the DSA, and they quickly tossed it out. We spoke to Rafiki Kai, the digital doctor, Karen R., the distributor for Cookie Lee, Jay Spension, chief marketing officer for GM Cadillac, Terry Ash, Universal Music Group's premium sales president, Harry Kurtz, owner of Mobile Marketing Resource Associations, Wally Amos, keynote speaker and founder of famous, uh, Wally Amos' famous cookies, we also spoke to Grace Kihohoho at the time, co-founder of Direct Selling Women's Alliance. Bill Sutton, Vice President of Marketing and Business Consultant for the National Basketball Association. And Karen Levy, VP Universal Music Group's uh, store and eBay and, Urban, eBay and Urban Entertainment Marketing Consultant. We spoke to all of those people in this book and we gave it to the DSA. This is relevant. Because in our next segment, I'm going to read something absolutely fascinating to you. And it comes back to the question, is the DSA in trouble? Because it doesn't seem as though they know what to do when it comes to enhancing our image and building the brand of direct selling. When I come back. No family can survive on two incomes anymore, let alone one. If you are supplementing your family's income working from home, then tune into The Cash Flow Show, Direct Sales Radio. Host Deb Bixler brings you sales tips, lead generation systems, and best business practices that guarantee direct sales success. Whether you're looking for a little extra cash or a career change, The Cash Flow Show, Direct Sales Radio, will give you proven systems that will work in your home business. The Cash Flow Show every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time on World Talk Radio Variety. Welcome back to On Air. Glad you could join me. 
As you can see, in 2003, in Boca Raton, Florida, at the DSA's annual convention, then DSA President Neil Offen was very upset at the negative perception that the world, but certainly more to his point, that Americans have of the direct selling industry, of the profession. He was so angry, he was talking about, we need to do something. We cannot wait. We need to do it now. Because when 50% of the public has a negative perception of you, you've got a problem. <laughs> Ask any presidential nominee. 50% of the public typically hates any presidential nominee. And that's a problem you really have to overcome. A recent article or two in Direct Selling News by DSA Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer Amy Robinson really caused a red flag for me to go up. In 1976, as I said in the previous session, the DSA got pollster Lou Harris to do a study on the perceptions that Americans have of the direct selling industry. And as I said, it's pretty bad, 50%. That's almost 40 years ago. And the DSA still tries to come up with ways to fix it. And today they still don't have a clue. Don't have a clue at all. Even though we sent them the book that we wrote, me and a couple of other people, the Network Marketing Direct Selling's official guide to do the urban market, how to take some of the strategies from some of the top marketers in the world, the top marketer for the NBA, National Basketball Association, for Universal Music, and Cadillac General Motors, some of the top people saying that if they were in charge of marketing the direct selling industry, this is what they would do. If they had one year, we sent this to the DSA, to Amy Robinson and Neil and Neil Offen at the time, and they apparently chucked it. Because the questions they're asking today are right here. The answers are right here. In fact, the questions that they asked today, we asked back in 2005 when we wrote this book. It's still right here. I'm going to read part of an article from February in Direct Selling News that Amy Robinson wrote about the marketing of direct selling and the whole image thing. It's shocking in a lot of ways, but I'm going to read it to you because I think we all need to understand what is going on here. There are also additional forces at play politically that have just changed the whole dynamic of direct selling today, particularly for the DSA. Their power is not what it used to be because companies are now putting money directly into political campaigns and when they do that the question has to be why do I need the DSA when I have my own political influence right here I don't need you I can do this on my own this probably speaks to the point why the DSA's member numbers are stagnant under 190 when at one point they were upwards of 240 260 but I digress I'm going to read this February 1st article in direct selling news DSA pilot marketing campaign to educate public with company health. For a number of years now, you've probably heard the Direct Selling Association taking, talking about its image enhancement program. This image enhancement program was supposedly kicked off years ago. About its image enhancement program, an effort on an industry level to educate the public about direct selling and its benefits. The goal of the DSA's efforts has been to soften the marketplace for independent sellers so they could focus on their company's unique selling proposition and not on debunking the many myths associated with direct selling network marketing, multi-level marketing, or any other of the many terms that may have a less than positive connotation in the minds of consumers. Now I'm going to stop right there. The goal of the image enhancement program was to enhance the image of direct selling to the public. Flat out. Nothing else matters. You enhance the image so that we are viewed in a much more positive light. But now she's saying that the goal really was to soften the marketplace for independent sellers and not debunk any of the myths associated with network marketing, multi-level marketing, direct selling. You've got to be kidding me. Without debunking the myths, you cannot soften the marketplace. You cannot enhance the image. That's the only thing that matters. Your job was not to soften the marketplace. Companies can do that on their own. As you continue to read more into the article, there are some more curious statements in here. And it's, it's odd. 
And I think it's very telling about where the DSA is right now. They could be in trouble. She goes on to say, if there has ever been a time when it's beneficial for direct selling companies to lock arms and sing a universal refrain, this is it. We said this back in 2005, seven years ago, when we sent this to them. As I said, they chucked it. We gave them the analogy. Here it is in a nutshell. The NBA has 30 teams, yet each team markets in their own region, in, in, on their own national scale, on their own global scale, and yet there's a major marketing arm within the NBA that markets the NBA as a whole. And every team markets to their own market, but at the end of the day, they all put in so that the NBA could be marketed as a whole. I told them, this is what needs to happen in direct selling. And it needs to be done with entertainment and sports marketing strategies. Now, she's saying seven years later, if there was ever a time when it's beneficial for direct selling companies to lock arms in arm and sing a universal refrain, I, this is the time. I think this might be more to do with political pressures than anything else. Because they are not picking up the memberships or the members they once had. In fact, they're losing them. And their political clout is being lost in Washington because companies are going direct and pouring in millions of dollars to their politicians or political causes that they wish. It goes on to say, let's delete the word image from our vocabulary. What? We have an image problem. You institute an image enhancement program, and now you say, let's delete the word image from our vocabulary? Goes on to say, no one wants to believe that they have a poor image. And trying to improve it is all, always requires dredging up the reasons why one acquired a poor image in the first place. Uh, yeah. Instead, let's focus on the many reasons why direct selling is a profession of the future. We keep being the profession of the future. I've been in direct selling for almost 20 years, and back then we were the profession of the future. We cannot be the profession of the future. We need to be the profession, the industry of the now, today, yesterday, not tomorrow. There are millions of entrepreneurial young people entering the workforce every day who don't want traditional employment. Now, remember that line because that plays into her March article that I will pick up on tomorrow. There are millions of entrepreneurial young people entering the workforce every day who don't want traditional employment, meaning they don't want a job. Keep that in mind. They don't want a job because there will be some contradiction to that statement tomorrow. She goes on to say, now, that's a positive, people are seeking something that will change one or more aspects of their lives. And direct selling can help them do that. Now, that's a positive message. Now, that's a positive message. It would be hard for any direct selling company to disavow. And the good news, as you read this, the direct selling association is in the midst of a 12-week pilot marketing campaign designed to test the messages and approaches intended to have a broad impact on the general understanding of the benefits of direct selling. Your pilot program will end somewhere in April. We're going to be very interested to see what you got out of that because your pilot program was only done in St. Louis, Missouri and Tampa Bay, Florida. You go on to say the messaging will, the messages, messaging will be supported by an invitation to implore. I'm going to slow down here. I'm going to reread this. The messaging will be supported by an invitation to explore the full range of direct selling companies via the DSA directory with the ability to request additional information from one or more companies. It sounds to me, based on that comment, on that statement, that the DSA is trying to improve their memberships. It's not about the pilot program. It's about getting people to join the DSA to get the information. That's what it sounds like to me. Measurement and evaluation of the success of the program will include a variety of research and analytical techniques as well as business and, and performance data for participating member companies on both test and controlled markets. 
will no doubt uncover some key information that either supports our assumptions about the most effective ways to market the benefits of direct selling as an industry or perhaps provide us with new and critical insights to help us shape our outreach in the future. Now, I have to ask the question here, when you say you'll no doubt uncover some key information that either supports your assumptions, if you already have the assumptions, why not get started? Why not do something? You need more testing? Lou Harris gave you the information almost 40 years ago. Your image enhancement program started a decade ago, and you still? You almost sound like Mitt Romney a couple of days ago when asked about the Afghan war. What do you think? What should happen? And he still says 10 years after the war, I still don't have enough data to move forward. You've got to be kidding me. You have the information. I don't think you have the know-how. I think that's the problem. She closes out with this, for better or worse, we are all in this together. If we're all in this together, then why not have everyone involved? Right now, it's just 188 member companies. Direct selling is much, much larger than 188 thousands of companies. But to say we're all in this for better or for worse, we're in this together, not if everyone doesn't get a chance to participate. You've got a pilot program and no one knows about it unless they read the USA Today. It's, it's mind-boggling. I, I don't get it. For everything that makes a company unique, there are, just, there are just as many good things that bind it together with our industry. I think they're in trouble. I think they are trying to figure out what to do. They being the DSA. And not only is the DSA in trouble, but every association is in trouble. The MLMIA has apparently entered into talks again with the Association of Network Marketing Professionals because those two associations figured the best way for them to solve their growth issues is to come together. The DSWA last year had their struggles. I think a lot of it, certainly for the DSA, is political. As they see Amway go off and do their thing, New Skin do their thing politically, uh, Melaleuca do their thing politically, For Life do their thing, companies pouring money into their own political candidates, bypassing the DSA, I think it puts the DSA in a tough spot. Tomorrow, we will talk more about what's going on and the political impact and how the DSA can right the ship and right the ship for direct selling as a whole. When I come back, special comment on gratitude, a company that gets it right. When I come back. Gratitude. What does it mean? I tend to think gratitude is showing an outward expression of uh, thank you, of saying, you know, uh, of recognition of, of, of some kind, usually very, very nice or kind gesture. I've seen a lot of people in direct selling talk about gratitude, talk about coming back and saying thank you, recognizing people for things that they've done for you. It's not always necessary, but every now and then it, it's good. The reason why I bring this up is because there is a company in direct selling that does gratitude in a big way. Who is that company? It happens to be one of my favorite companies. I have a lot of favorite companies. It happens to be one of my favorite, but it's Zango. Well, why do I bring this up? We've been doing the Power 50 and the Women of Power for almost five years, those lists. And it's rare that when someone makes our Power 50, the people that make it say anything, even recognize the fact that they've made it, even though you go to their websites and you see mention of them being on the Power 50 or the Women of Power all the time. There are some people who are just flat out fantastic at it. They call us, they say, thank you so much for the consideration, I really appreciate it. Lisa Wilbur over at Avon is just great. Deb Bixler is fantastic. Aaron Garrity, uh, CEO and Chairman of Zango is just great. But Zango did something this time that was just totally blew me away, totally out of the box. In previous years, what Zango has done once they've gotten some sort of recognition from, from us or from me, they've flown me over to Utah to say thank you, spend some time, get to know some of the people over there, and I understand why. 
not only is it all about gratitude, but thank you, but there's a, a media savviness about Zango that isn't always understood by others in direct selling, other celebrities or other executives in direct selling. Not only do you take this time to say thank you every now and then, but what Zango does, they make it a point to let you know that they really appreciate it. Last week, I'm coming into the office and there's two boxes waiting for me. I have absolutely no idea who it's from and why. One's a small box about this big. The other is a huge box. I mean, it goes outside the frame here. I open it up and I'm asking my wife, what is it? Who's it from? On the, on the label it says Zango. I'm like, okay, well, why did Zango send me something? What, what's going on here? We open the box, and every product that Zango has is in this box, along with shirts, swag, jacket, just all kinds of stuff. I get a call from Zango's uh, Ashley Elfson, who's the, uh, um, the secretary's personal assistant to Aaron Gary, and she says that Aaron wants to give you a call. Will you be available? So I say, yeah, so we have to call for a couple of days. A couple of days go by, happened to be Friday of last week, and Ashley calls and says, okay, Aaron is ready for you, and so are the others. And I'm thinking, the others? <laughs> who, who are the others? <laughs> they patch me into the conference line, and lo and behold, the founders, along with Aaron, are all there. You've got Joe Morton, Gordon Morton, uh, Kent Wood, Gary Hollister, who am I forgetting, Aaron Garrity, uh, Brian Davis was not there, but they all just wanted to have me on the line to say thank you for recognizing Zango in, in the way that you do. And I said, well, you know, uh, it's not necessary that you send me anything. They said, thank you, is great. And they said, no, no. You know, uh, it, it's about an expression of gratitude. You know, we really appreciate it. And I'm just thinking to myself, wow, that's really doing it right. That's going above and beyond, quite frankly. But I understand. I understand the media relationships that companies have to have. And I understand what the give and take is all about. You know, I'm not silly. I'm not, not stupid here. But I will say this. I've had people who have made the Power 50 call and be very upset that they weren't ranked higher. In fact, I've had one association founder call and request that they be put up higher so they could be ahead of another association. I've had one of the top trainers and consultants who speaks on the topic of leadership call and berate me for not being on our Power 50. I contrast that with what Zango does. It's night and day. Gratitude is just an expression of, thank you, I appreciate what you've done. But I don't think anyone does it the way that Zango does. I mean, they make little old me feel like an absolute megastar in direct selling. I think everyone should be made to feel like a megastar. And if every company were to do it like Zango, I imagine a lot of new companies would not be coming into the industry saying, we want to be the next Zango.